Okay, in this presentation, uh, which follows on development theory basics, uh, we're going to talk about some of the current ideas. Uh, this is not in any way exhaustive uh, uh, or compre you know, overly comprehensive, but these are some ideas that have gotten some play that I think are interesting to consider. First, we're going to start with uh, an idea that uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs's uh, poverty trap concept uh, that actually I'm going to take two shots at in the slide presentation. Uh, and this is actually hearkening back to development economics. After it became clear that the neoclassical approach to things wasn't working, or their, their idea that just encourage savings in these countries and they'll catch up right quick, uh, not working so much. Their was a innovation in, in thinking uh, often referred to as development economics that basically said oh well these countries are are having some kind of trouble we need to pour money into them to bring them up you know and and still kind of thinking in terms of neoclassics you know add inputs to the system um, that idea kind of fell out of favor and has reemerged in many, in some people say that it's the reemergence of development economics in the form of Jeffrey Sachs uh, and the Millennial Development Goals and and you know kind of the the Sachs the Sachs esque uh, push for increased aid to nations and uh, Jeffrey Sachs makes the argument that. Uh, the poor countries are in a trap where they have poor health, education, and infrastructure that reinforce each other to stall the growth. And um, basically, these countries just don't have enough to save. They, you know, you can't look at them uh, in any way saving enough money, developing enough investment capital to produce growth. And therefore, he argues that foreign aid is is needed to increase investment in these poor nations until they take off, right? And there was actually that take off is a technical term going back to uh, Rostov who, who argued that, you know, nations add to, uh, you know, have to add, get out of subsistence farming and they get to a certain point of technological development where their markets become efficient enough and uh, to employ all the aspects of their society and then they take off and, and grow at a fast rate. Um, and so, like I say, this is this was an idea. You know, it was real popular in the 60s, 70s. Fell out of favor, and Sachs kind of dusts it off uh, in a way, and by applying it mainly to the poorest of poor nations around the world. Okay, the whipping boy of uh, international political economy, the Washington Consensus, which is often referred to as neoliberalism largely by its critics, in yet another inventive use of the word liberal. Uh, you know, we, we now, although it's it's probably about right in terms of our academic meaning, where liberal policy refer, you know, to John Locke and Adam Smith and those guys, uh, and they're, they're be calling, call, being called neoliberals because they are bringing out these supply side ideas, these old markets are good, this government needs to get out of it, you know, this kind of laissez-faire mentality. Um, and so like I say, neoliberal is basically a pejorative term. The Washington Consensus was another one applied. And basically the Washington Consensus uh, developed, it's called the Washington Consensus because of uh, the concentration of the Bretton Woods organizations, the IMF and the World Bank in Washington. And the policymakers after the Cold War and the seeming triumph of capitalism and all sorts of growth, we got this huge push for liberalization uh, and this idea that, hey, what you need to do developing nations, uh, you know, it's not, uh, and by the way, I've skipped over things like dependency theory and world systems theory that argued uh, in the 70s that the developing nations were caught in a trap that the world economic system was rigged against them and so they needed to change the system they needed infusions of money to redress the wealth that was exploited out of them and you know 
uh, and so it was a, a, a view that the world system was rigged against developing nations. The Washington Consensus comes in and says, eh, it ain't rigged against you. Your own rules and institutions in your country have impaired the operation of the free market. You need to, uh, a, you know, address, adjust the structure of your economy. This has led to a policy of what was called structural adjustment. And the guiding principles of this, uh, that you can go and there's a list of policy, more specific policy prescriptions, but I think they, the idea, it fell into these categories. First of all, you had to free your domestic markets to determine prices. Let the market work, right? So you need to liberalize trade and capital flows. You need to start adopting neutral policies for towards industries. Do not try to spur the development of one industry versus another. Don't pick winners. Let the market decide who's going to win. Um, also do away with your trade and capital controls to allow those markets to function. The second thing is you need to adjust prices in your country to scarcity values. In other words, get the prices right. Many countries had controls over prices. They either subsidized prices, had price supports, uh, in some cases price controls, which are just seen as being evil. Uh, and so you've got to eliminate these prices, right? Stop trying to keep them down. Stop trying to prop them up, whatever you're doing. Let the prices float. Um, especially, you know, the idea of a scarcity value. Scarcity value is the idea that uh, you know, what you pay for something must reflect the scarcity of the resources that go into it. And so you have to pay for uh, the, you know, the provision of whatever product or good it is you're consuming. And to give you an example, in one Latin American country, they uh, tried to keep the price of phones down, right? And so the government was controlling the price that the, the phone company could produce and keeping it low. The problem was that simply did not cover the cost of putting in phones. The phone company could only devote a certain amount of resources to installing phones and therefore they undersupplied it, right? The price wasn't covering, the price you paid to get the phone installed didn't cover the price of doing it. Therefore, they were like, I think it was it, the, the backlog numbered in the millions. Right? When you asked for, you call to get a phone, yeah, right, we'll add you to the list. If, on the other hand, you pay the scarcity value, right, then when you say, hey, I want a phone, you offer to pay the, re the cost of the phone, and therefore the resources to hire a guy to come out and install your phone exist. Okay? And, and when they privatized the phone company, the prices went up, but guess what? The backlog went away. Um, also, avoid... So besides doing that, getting prices in line, avoid excessive use of tax incentives. Uh, you know, these distort the market, and there are horror stories of countries uh, offering tax incentives to start factories in certain regions of their country where the it made sense based on the tax incentives for a company to go do it, but if you looked at production without the tax incentives, the company was taking a loss. It was more costly to produce the products than to sell them. And so the company was taking a loss before the taxes. And so this is destroys wealth, right? When you, you know, build, when you make something for $100 and sell it for 70, you just destroyed $30 of wealth. Never mind that you have tax incentives that make up the difference and to make it value, worthwhile to you to do it. Uh, you're just basically getting the government to pay you to, to destroy, to burn money. Um, Shifting resources from government into private hands, right? This is privatization. Get the government out of the business. You know, either sell the government business or allow the business to run as a business, right? You might think of the post the post office. The U.S. government does not, I mean, it owns it, but it doesn't run it anymore. The post office is set up and is supposed to run itself as a business. Um, with, and that worked out, sort of. Uh, they're having trouble, but then uh, who wouldn't? Uh, Reduce, don't eliminate budget deficits. Try to get your spending on investments and support of the private sector, right? So this is privatization. Then rationalize the government's remaining role in development, right? You know, 
even though we've shrunk the amount of intervention, the role the government has in the economy, they're still going to have a role. And make sure that you're channeling money into projects with the higher rate of return, not to the projects that have more political support. Um, if you have a government corporation, hold it accountable. And reduce your payrolls, continue in, and by all means, continue investing in human capital and physical infrastructure. These are deemed to be core government roles and important things to do. And then uh, reform your institutions. Right? Uh, in the last slide, I talked about rent seeking, right? or the last presentation. Licensing authorities are just seen as being hotbeds of corruption. You know, the, generally the argument is get rid of these things, right? Don't license something unless you have to. Let people do stuff without asking you for freaking permission. Because, you know, unless you've got some other, you know, really compelling reason, uh, it just slows things down and creates these opportunities for rent seeking uh, and create new financial instruments and institutions. You need more. Uh, savings and investment in your country, you need to create new institutions for doing that, and decentralize government activities as much as possible. Right? Don't direct everything from the capital. Let local policy decision makers do things on their own. And there is nothing wrong with anything in this list. Right? This all makes sense in a lot of ways. However, uh, especially when took the form less of general policy guidance and more into do specific things, a lot of times governments would do this stuff and they would still have problems, right? And so the Washington Consensus, along with the policy of requiring governments to do structural adjustment and to get loans, IMF conditionality, uh, really got a lot of pushback and there was a uh, and, and there were a lot of cases of governments doing this and, and having just massive problems as a result. So the Washington Consensus by this point is a bad word, you know, uh, and there's a lot of uh, doubt about this, even though the basic principles aren't in any one case totally assailable. They, they make sense. It's just pushing people to do all this liberalization isn't maybe the best policy is, is kind of the, the, the view that people have nowadays. In terms of development assistance, um, Easterly, who was a, an economist working for uh, these organizations like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, he wrote a book uh, Wrote, has written many things, and uh, one of his books, White Man's Burden, kind of provocatively titled, is talking about kind of the paternalistic attitude of aid, or, aid or organizations. And Easterly is very critical of the development assistance community's approach. He argues that they come in uh, with a plan like the Washington Consensus, and it's a top-down, cookie-cutter approach. This is what you need to do. And so they're, in his view, they are planners. They come in with a plan. They may adapt it somewhat to the general conditions of the economy, but they're very much at the national level doing top-down planning. And he says what you need to have is a approach. You need to be a searcher. You need to send people into countries working at the lower level, the subnational level, that search for ways to improve economic conditions. Don't come in with a preconceived notion. Come in looking for what can we do? What would really help? Right? So he makes a big distinction between coming in as a planner or coming in as a searcher. And um, basically, you know, and he has a book, and this is, that's more or less the overarching idea that he's got. Um, and so he argues that, look, we got to stop this large-scale top-down planning. We can't you know, come in with one answer to the solution. We have to be uh, more open and looking for what the actual problem is and then figuring out the best way to solve the problem. Um, he argues that, you know, the violence, wars, right, don't ever, you know, he's like, don't kid yourself, military operations to improve countries don't generally work. The violence creates bigger problems than it solves. Uh, although I don't know how much of that violence we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, today, but uh, 
he argues you've got to give aid to individuals, not to governments. Right? When you give aid to governments, you make them responsive to the donor organizations. When you give money to individuals, they deal with their needs, and then the gov because they have money, the government pays attention to them. This fosters relationships between the government and the population and you know helps the population to make their demands not also it also gets down to them right when we're giving to people they solve their own problems um he argues that the international system you need of of aid is is kind of broken that um agencies all go into countries to fix everything right and they put everything on their their plate and they make in order to attract donations very often they have to say that they're going to solve huge problems they tend to look at a country and say here's the, the big problems in this country we're all going to solve this and he says look this doesn't work if everyone's responsible for everything nobody's accountable for anything and so he says look you've got to you know work it out that you hold agencies and projects accountable for achieving measurable achievable goals right and then you've got to have the incentive structure of the agencies worked to that right and so somehow this is, involves changing the donor arrangement right you have to basically be uh you know creating this incentive like if you want your reputation if you want a good reputation if you want to attract more investment or more donations you need to be achieving results and, and they need to be small goals, therefore. Um, you need an, a decentralized approach, which in turn means you need input and feedback from the poor. What do they need? Do they need malaria nets? Do malaria nets work for them? Right? What, what is it that they need, really? Uh, and therefore, you know, you've got to let your aid agents search and experiment. Right? You've got to send them in they've got to be able to get that feedback apply it do something right and the thing is you you, you hold them accountable for their results uh, and along with this you want to reward success and punish failure and channel aid you know towards those successes reinforcing them And he said this approach would be far preferable to the current approach so he he thinks that just the aid agencies right now are a mess and they need to fundamentally change how they do it. And, and basically, he's arguing that you need this bottom-up approach. Returning to Jeffrey Sachs, just a minute, and he kind of fits in all of this, um, fleshing out his argument and uh, kind of going deeper into it, uh, he argues that this this poverty trap, the trap here, to flesh this out a little more, uh, the poor nations lack capital, right? Capital comes from savings. And when you're poor, you don't have a lot of savings. And he argues that in these countries, because their populations tend to grow, uh, they are, they experience a declining ratio of capital to people, right? So that the per capita capital shrinks, right, as the population grows, but the econ faster than the economy, and uh, as it shrinks or declines, you're getting farther away from being able to invest in your own development, right. So this is the key thing that your savings are your capital supply is growing slower than your population, and this is more you know this is what creates a trap. Because you you know you weren't you were you know if you have less and less capital being invested you're going to grow presumably slower and slower. He argues developed nations need to provide sufficient assistance to raise the capital stock above this subsistence level. And this is a little bit different than the old development economics concept, right? Um, and he argues, look, you know, venture capital go if a venture capitalist goes into a, a business and tries to set it up. Uh, the good ones f are going to be sure to fund all the businesses' needs, right? So they're not going to come in and say, all right, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay for this, that, and the other thing, but I'm not going to pay for your marketing, right? So I'm going to pay for you to develop this project, but I'm not going to give you any money to market it, right? Well, that's going to fail, right? Because every 
business needs to market itself. And that's, you know, so you need to fully fund the needs of the business to get it to take off. And he argues this is what the developing nations and the development assistance people haven't been doing. They've been partially funding these things and wondering why they're not taking off. Um, in general, and in here we go a little deeper, uh, he wants the public sector to focus on human capital, education, uh, and uh, it's two things, education and health, right? If you aren't healthy and you're, you know, your kids are dying, uh, if you have high infant mortality rates, well, women are getting pregnant more often, declining their productivity, and they're spending a lot of resources on taking care of the sick kid, uh, and you're, you're not gaining anywhere. So you need, your, you need your health to be improved as well as your education to be improved. Infrastructure, need infrastructure, roads, railroads, ports, power generation, sewers, water, uh, which, you know, very important. Um, natural capital, he throws in this idea, and, and he put, he's putting capital behind a lot of things here, and so I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, this is environment, the ecosystem. Uh, public institutional capital, here's the most problematic use of it. And here he's talking about just reforming the institutions, getting, you know, having good police power, having a good functioning government. Um, you know, these things need to be put into place. And, and again, back to the security, right? You need to have security. A lot of these countries don't have uh, a good judicial system or police power. You still have not completely domesticated violence in the country. And then knowledge capital, right? You need to improve that, your information technology. Uh, and he might be, uh, you know, education may be falling here. Usually education comes under human capital. Whenever anyone else uses that term, that's the case. But these are the things he sees the public sector focusing on, while private sector should focus on providing business capital. Um, of course, why they would do this until we approach the point of takeoff, I'm not quite sure, but he seems to, you know, this part of his argument is that we want that separation. But again, he's making this argument, you need to lift bot nations up to the bottom rung of the development ladder if you're to, if you're to get up going anywhere. Now, a different view of this is taken by Hubbard and Duggan in what they call the aid trap, a book called the aid trap. And they make the argument that aid is a trap because it's paid to governments and it focuses governments on relations with donors and not with domestic interests. In fact, in many cases, insulates them from domestic interests and it doesn't really get the economy functioning, right? And so very much like uh, Easterly, uh, although Easterly might have problems with these guys, but um, they're sort of making this argument, don't give money to governments, give money to individual businesses. And even, you know, if you look at Sachs, Sachs wants businesses to come in and invest in the private sector. So he wants money to go to those individuals, go to the private individuals in the, in the country. Hubbard and Duggan, uh, they look at uh, the Marshall Plan as an exemplar. And they argue that the, the, the genius of the Marshall Plan was that the money did not go to the governments. The money went to private firms in a country. Private you know, businesses or individuals would apply there to, there was a, an organization set up to run this stuff. They would apply for loans. They would get the loans. And... Very often in the Marshall Plan, the loans were, you know, if you, you know, the only place you could buy anything at, at the end of World War II was the United States, really, because we bombed pretty much everyone else, everyone else's industrial capacity, uh, and so you were essentially to set up these businesses, you were getting loans to buy American machinery, American products, American, uh, you know, materials or you know, whatever it was you wanted to do with your business, you were probably buying it from America. And you need, you know, you needed dollars to do it, and here's some dollars, go buy that stuff. Um, and that was kind of how America got its taste, right? It got our piece of the pie our, uh, in the form of increased exports. However, the people, you know, they would help these people arrange to buy the things because uh, you needed that help at that point. We didn't have good functioning markets. 
the the thing is, once you got the loan and then you got the stuff, right? You paid the loan back, not to the Marshall Plan folks, but to the government, and the government set up agencies to collect this money, and very importantly you could pay it back in the local currency right and again the united states had no interest in encouraging exports from europe because we were trying to maximize our exports because we had 80 percent of the productive capacity in the world and guess what our demand was weak right we had a we end of world war ii cla i mean probably, probably the worst case of over ability to supply and under you know relative to demand because no one in the rest of the world was buying any had any dollars to buy from us and also in the united states we had all these guys coming back from the war and you know they wanted jobs but who's going to buy that stuff um anyway i digress with the marshall plan though you could pay back in your local currency and then the government had that money that they could use and so some governments spent it on projects or assistance you know the, uh, the French are notably they they would spend it on rebuilding a lot of things uh, and so the government used that money as revenue um, which of course placed a lower tax burden on people so it's that you know nothing wrong with that uh, in Germany being Germans they put it in the bank and they reloaned it out <laughs> To, and they kept reloaning it out for decades, and so that was what you know. So each government, though, had a lot of latitude because they didn't have to answer to the donor, right? The donor had given it to that business and told them to pay it back to the government. So once the government got it, it had been laundered, if you will, uh, in a political sense. It had been politically laundered. I like that. I just came up with that. Uh, and so they were, you know, not being told by the United States how to use that money, and they could make their own decisions about what the best possible use was for it. So Hubbard and Duggan are saying, look, this is what we need to do, right? We need to set up this system, give money to the businesses. When you're, when you're giving money, don't give it to the government, give it to the business and then tell them to pay it back to the government and then the, let the, let them deal with the government. And that will encourage relations between the government and the private sector will focus the government on their needs. It will give the government a source of revenue that it can use, and like I say, that is independent, that it is not politically motivated. And so you're going to basically, this is going to spur, directly spur the private sector growth, while also encouraging the government to develop a productive relationship with that sector. You know, the sector is going to have money. So the government's going to have to meet the demands and needs of the sector, but it's also, you know, the sector is going to be giving the government resources uh, by paying back the loan, and so it's going to help the government. And and this is going to, they argue, this is going to spur domestic institutional and uh, political economic development in ways that giving money to the government not only won't produce, but will impair by making the government more focused on outside donors than it is on its own business interests, right? And so that's an interesting idea, I think. Finally, we have Hernando de Soto and the Mystery of Capital. And uh, the, it's actually the title of his book, The Mystery of Capital in the Amazon, but it goes on for a while. Um, but let's just call it The Mystery of Capital. And he basically uh, takes takes the view that uh, poor people have capital. They have a lot of capital. And they have it in various forms. They have things they own. But more importantly, and especially in countries with indigenous populations that are, or, or, or traditional societies uh, that are informal, They're, they haven't been, very often you have large chunks of the society that weren't included in a colonial economy or in a colonial legal system or were kind of ignored right and he argues that a lot of people around the world have resources that they have a right to use that they have a recognized customary or traditional right to use but they don't have title to it right the formal legal system wasn't extended into those parts of the economy and therefore they don't have title to it and cannot 
sell it or lease it or use it as collateral for a loan. And the lack of legal rights he sees as being a really big problem because he's, he's arguing, look, these people do have capital. And the thing is that we have a situation where they, they don't have formal rights to it. The legal system thus is flawed. And this is preventing these people from participating in markets and liberalization. They don't, you know, they can't get loans, they can't sell the land, and worse yet, people can come in and challenge their rights to them and, you know, take their land. They can say, well, you're, you know, you, you, yes, you've been using this land, but you don't own it. I bought the deed to this from this guy. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to, you know, kick you off of it. And, you know, this is, that's the kind of thing that starts revolutions and, or, or insurgencies. And he says that, you know, and it's also the kind of thing that when you liberalize the economy and make it more market-based, you leave these people behind and, and therefore they don't support your liberalization. They, they, they don't participate in it. They don't benefit from it, and in fact, they, they, they see other people benefit from it and them being left behind, and so it leads them to be politically agitating against these changes. So, what he argues that nations need to do is they need to reform their property rights system uh, to record these customary, or to bring in these customary property rights, codifying them, right? And then these people suddenly have capital, and... Uh, so, you know, if you if a company wants to come in and use their land, well, now they can sell it. And they may, because, you know, the company will have to offer them if everything works in the legal system, which is, some people have argued, argued is very problematic. But if you do this right, then people will pay them for their reason. And then, okay, cool. And then they have money, right, that they can invest in something else, right? So instead of being deprived of their livelihood, they can go seek another one. Or... With those property rights, they can, you know, they now have collateral and they can take out loans and benefit from liberalized financial institutions and invest in their property and increase their, their standard of living. And so, you know, this will help the individual poor person. It will also help the society to accept the liberalization. It will expand the benefit of the liberalization and it will stir, spur growth because guess what? Now you have more capital. Right? You're putting it to work and you're using it more efficiently. Uh, and so he argues that this is this is the thing, right? The mystery of capital is, is by giving these people these controls, they suddenly make a lot of money. And he has worked, you know, this guy is a guy who walks it like he talks it. He's gone out and worked in various areas. And there, I, there are a lot of videos online. He actually produced a video series where he talks about various instances and uh, so he's done it. So he has the advantage of having out, been, gone out there, been there, done that, and argues that it works. Um, and I have no, you know, I, I think if you can do this, it will work. I don't think that, you know, this is a good thing. Uh, the problem is doing it, right? Because you're talking about changing the legal code, giving people who are disadvantaged and disenfranchised power. Um, and, you know, economics is a, a positive sum game and a mutual benefit, but political power is more of a zero-sum game. And, uh, you know, so there can be, there, w there will probably often be interests that will either seek to oppose these changes or to nullify them in practice, you know, the judges and stuff. And so it, it's very problematic to do this. However, you know, that it needs to be done is, is I think, very clear-cut. And so it's, I think it's, it's a very worthwhile project. It is remarkable in that it's it's definitely applying the concepts of the free market, but at the same time, it's very invasive. It's saying, but you've got to change your legal system, right? We've got to change how you do things. And uh, so it's a very interesting uh, concept here. Okay, that should finish up uh, everything I've got to say in this, uh, in this go round. Uh, of course, like I say, there are many other ideas out there. I think these are some of the, the more current ones and some of the more interesting ones that we've got going on. Uh, and so I, I hope these have been kind of thought-provoking. 
Uh, there are certainly, like I say, in the case of Hernando de Soto, there's certainly a lot of online resources you can go to and look up and kind of see these things deeper. Um, I, and uh, I encourage you to do so.